Hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. <sighs> How is everyone doing out there? As always, I'm just looking, checking, as always, with the beginning of these live streams, if you can see me and hear me, please let me know. Just someone out there say hi and let me know that the tech is working on your end. Because sometimes it doesn't work so well on my end. <laughs> Does that make sense? So hello, and if you can see me or hear me, yeah, send me a little uh, hello. Let me know that things are working out okay from the tech side of things. I get all of these interesting messages over here. But it looks like uh, things are kind of working enough. So yeah, I'm just going to jump in. <sighs> Welcome. <laughs> it's that kind of Wednesday afternoon, folks. Welcome to another pop-up art studio a live stream that we do every Wednesday here from the living room at home. Uh, since closing the studio space and being in between our next space, which is our mobile art hive, we like doing things online to connect with people, connect with new people, to stay connected to folks. Hello, Wendy, and hello, Nicole. Oh, it's good that I can be seen and heard. That's good. Thank you. Uh, just something we like to do here to yeah, stay connected, stay creative, give folks opportunities to chat one another with one another, to learn and explore about the kind of creativity that's going on out there, to share what they're working on, to have opportunities to inspire one another, to be inspired. And hello, Wendy. Hello, Nicole. As always, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to start this week with a little intro. And I realized the last few live streams, I haven't gone as in depth as I usually do. So I'm going to go a little old school. I'm going to revisit some of the things we used to talk about at the beginning of our live streams early on, just to wrap up everyone who might be joining us for the first time and to remind folks who maybe have been watching or participating for longer that, you know, this is an art hive. So if you've never experienced an art hive or a virtual art hive before here at the living room, we like to remind everyone that you are all artists, no matter who you are, where you are, what your abilities are, what your technique level is, whether you're a professional or someone who just likes to create for the heck of it, because you can, because creativity is a, is a birthright. Every human being is born creative. And what you choose to do with that creativity, it's up to you. But don't let anyone ever tell you that you're not an artist, because you are. <laughs> And of course, being an artist has very little to do with technique when it comes down to it. When we talk about being an artist, what we're talking about is your ability, your superpower to tell stories, to communicate something about who you are, what it's like to be you, how you see the world, how you want to see the world through whatever it is you create. And when we talk about art, we're talking about all different forms of creative self-expression. So not just Eurocentric things, hey, Tanya, not just Eurocentric things that you might see hanging on the walls of traditional fine arts museums and galleries, not just oil paintings of, you know, rich guys on horses in front of mansions. We're talking about anything that you make that helps you feel good, that makes you feel better. Again, that tells that story of who you are and where you're at right now. You can make art for yourself. You can make art for other people. All that matters is that it feels right to you wherever you're at right now. And sometimes that can be making ugly art, making something, making a mess just because you can and because it helps move you to that next place, wherever, it, wherever that is, wherever it is you want to be. And of course, all arts are welcome. So that is traditional kind of art making things like painting or drawing or sketching. Um, but it also includes things like collaging, like fiber arts, knitting, crocheting, sewing, weaving, maybe literature, so creative writing, uh, poetry, spoken word, performance, dance, although we don't get a lot of dance here in the virtual art hive. <laughs> but maybe that'll change once we get our mobile art hive out there. Maybe, maybe it will. Um, so yeah, there's so many different ways we can express ourselves. So please don't feel like you need to limit yourself to whatever I happen to be making today. Do what feels right for you. 
And of course, we ask everyone to be super supportive and respectful of one another, negotiate consent, which is kind of hard to do in, in this way, this place, the virtual place. But you know what? It all comes down to this. When in doubt, ask. And I will do my best to remember to ask you and check in with you folks along the way. Of course, during the live stream, it's a little easier to do that once it's been archived. Hello, everyone who's watching later. Once it's been archived, I may not have the same chance. So whether you're watching when it's live or not, if I do anything or say anything or act in any ways that make you feel uncomfortable or weird, or you're just, you just don't understand why I'm doing or saying the things I'm doing or saying, please feel free to ask. Reach out, let me know. If you don't feel quite ready to do it in the live, in the chat that's happening out there in the community, you can always send me an email later at info at livingroomcommunityartstudio.org. Or you can message me on Facebook, but email is often the fastest way to get a hold of me these days, believe it or not. Um, and what else? Yeah. I guess the final thing really to remind you about is just to take care of yourself today. This world is wonderful, but it's also super weird sometimes. And I don't know about where you're at in the world, but where I'm at today, things feel strange and they feel uncertain and wibbly wobbly, as my friend Carlos would say. And like, like everything's constantly changing, sands shifting under our feet. We don't quite know what to expect from day to day. So in times like that, the best thing we can do is do our best to stay in the moment, reach out for support, when we need it or want it and just be kind to ourselves be kind to ourselves start with that kindness towards yourself and you know what it inevitably flows to others that are around you too but it starts with ourselves doesn't it and when things are stressful for me sometimes it's hard but i do try to remind myself to start with myself first to be kind to myself first compassionate towards myself first because usually I don't know if you're like me but I tend to be my hardest critic and we tend to be really nice and supportive to everyone else but on days where it's a little bit uh, itchy and scratchy wow we can be mean to us so if you're having that kind of day and if your inner critic that's another word we use for that part of ourselves that isn't so nice to ourselves all the time. If your inner critic is acting up, let us know. We might be able to help talk to it, figure out what it wants. And if it has nothing constructive to say, tell it to go to another room or kick it out of the house or crunch it up and put it in the waste paper basket, whatever makes sense to you. And you know what? We learn how to have those conversations here. That's one of the things that art hives help do <laughs> because Creative humaning. Humaning is an art form as well, right? Day to day, we learn the art of being human. Trial and error, practicing, finding out what works for each of us. That's how we do this thing called, um, what is it called again? Living, living and humaning. So be kind to yourselves and let's just spend some time humaning and getting crafty today. I feel like getting crafty. Oh, another thing. If you're working on something out there that you're really, like maybe you're loving what you're doing or maybe you're having trouble with what you're doing or maybe you just want to show off what you're doing, let us know. Share what you're working on. Let me know what you're up to. I love chatting with people in the comments there. But if you just feel like watching or listening as we go through this next hour and a half, that's okay too. No need to join the chat if you don't feel up to it. I know there are days where I'm watching live streams and I don't want to chat. All I want to do is appreciate and relax and get inspired. So if that's where you're at today, that's okay too. And another thing, and then I promise I'll get to the making. I promise. If you are wherever you are and you don't feel like making art, you feel like doing something else while this is on, that's okay too. You can fold your laundry. You can pack your lunch for tomorrow. You can just rest just rest. Sometimes that's enough, right? Just do what you need to do. Take care of you. Stay for as long as you can, as long as you want, as long as you need. You can dip in and out if you like. That's what this is about. So don't feel like you have to stay the whole hour and a half. I'll be here, but just because I'm going to be here doesn't mean that you have to be here all that time either. Uh -huh, wow. And oh, hello, Kim. Kim saying, dang, back to work. Nice to see you. Oh, nice to see you too, Kim. Uh, it's so good to hear your voice. It's so good to see everyone who's joining in. Um, 
hello, hello, hello. Let me know how you're doing, if you're up to it, if you feel like it. I know that Tanya, I was thinking about you the other day when I was remembering some of those early days in the studio and those beautiful mixed media paintings you created. Such extraordinary art. And I've been feeling a little bit of that mixed media thing myself lately. I started, what did I start working on last week? It's actually a piece that's inspiring me today. So let's flip over and have some fun making art. So, okay, so, so, I don't know why I feel like whispering right now. I feel like it's one of those things where I'm like, everybody, come close. <laughs> Last week I was working on this piece as we talked about, um, well, as I was talking about, I was, you know, in that place thinking about the difficult conversations we have, the awkward conversations we sometimes had at the studio and how important it is to feel comfortable with being uncomfortable sometimes, to know the difference from when you're in pain and hurt or hurting versus when there's something important that needs to be said so that you can feel better and feel that relief, right? Uh, I started working on this piece and it was just like a little pop-up shrine and I kind of really enjoyed it, folks. I loved it and I really dig this piece. There's, you know what, my inner critics, because I have a choir of them, are super loud most of the time and managing them is like, you know, herding cats, as they say. Um, but this piece really struck a chord with me and just something about the inside and the outside and how it tells a story and how it has potential to tell more stories if I add into it. And so I thought, I want to make some more books today. I want to, like, maybe not a, like, that was kind of a pop-up shrine idea, but I thought, no, it feels more like a book. So today I'm going to create some books using Kleenex boxes because I like the idea of windows and things popping out. Some of you, uh, some folks out there might feel more comfortable describing it as a junk journal kind of book. Um, oh, thank you, Tanya. That piece I made, I had so much fun with that. Uh, but a junk journal is where you collect materials that wouldn't necessarily be used in traditional art making uh, or book binding for that matter. And you make your own book that can store different things, hold different things, just contain all the stuff that you might not want to put in a normal journal, whatever a normal journal is. It could have pockets to stash supplies, maybe keepsakes. I'm not sure what my book today is going to hold when I get through with it, but I wanted to explore using materials that I hand on hand that maybe you might have on hand too. Things that I've just been putting in the recycling for a little while. And the truth is I love, like look at that, the little windows that are there, built in pockets, the potential, the possibility. I just got really excited by this idea and who knows where it'll go today. But I'm gonna play and have some fun. But before I get there, would you like to join me in a little warm up? So I'm just going to stack this, move this over to the side. Stay there. I'll come back to you in a moment. And because of some of those things I was mentioning before, all the feels, right? Strange, uncertain time, lots of things going on in our brains. I thought maybe this is a good time to revisit a spiral again. So I'm going to grab some oil pastels, something really chunky and colorful that I can move around and it feels a little more physical than using a pen or a pencil. And I'm just going to start making my spiral, of course, inspired by Linda Berry's spiral activity, my own take on it because I'm a little more distracted than what she invites you <laughs> to do with hers, which is more of an active meditation, something to help you connect with your breath, to focus in the moment and not have to worry or think about anything else other than what the thing you're holding on to that's making your marks is doing on the surface that you're doing it on, if that makes sense. So just starting in the center of the page or wherever really, just giving yourself enough space. Now start making that mark and slowly, slowly, slowly spiraling outwards. And when I do this, I'm not so, so concerned if my lines crisscross or bump into each other. I'm 
really just doing my best to be present with my physical self and what's going on in my head. This kind of helps recalibrate me sometimes, if that makes sense. On those days or at those moments where my body feels separate, kind of disconnected a little bit from where my head is at. And there's no judgment there. It's not necessarily a bad thing when that happens. This is just a way of bringing them back in, helping them, giving them an opportunity to align with one another again. And if I wasn't chatting to you, which I love doing by the way, I would probably just be sitting here quietly, silently, mindful of my breath, making sure I was breathing. Because sometimes I think a lot of us forget to breathe and just hold our breath or get stuck in kind of shallow breathing, depending on what we're doing or what we're thinking about, what's distracting us. And then of course your other senses kick in as well. And you can hear the sound of your pen or my oil pastel in this case, making its marks on the paper. Don't know if you can hear it too out there. And there you have it. A little spiral, spiral. Sp wow, that sounds, that feels like a weird word to say all of a sudden. I've been having a lot of those moments this week. I don't know about you, a lot of those moments where words or things that I'm used to saying or thinking about suddenly feel very strange and very alien to me. Like I'm, I've kind of lost the sense of things all of a sudden. And that's not necessarily a bad place to be. It can be fun. It can feel a little bit like you're rediscovering something in the moment. Language, that happens with language too. And if anyone out there, I know I'm not the only one to suffer from migraines, but depending on where I'm at with my migraines, that might happen a little bit more or a little bit less. Today, I've got some migraine action going on, so it might be happening a little bit more. I'm just going to let it be. I'm just going to say, hey, hey, migraine, welcome, weird brain stuff. Welcome to the conversation. So now you know, too. So you can welcome it if you like as well. So something about the spiral exercise just helps me get in sync again, or as close to in sync as any one person can be in this strange and wonderful world. Yeah. Yeah, I dig it. And if you're into this, what I might recommend or invite you to do too, not the boss of you, obviously, but if this is something you enjoy doing yourself and have incorporated it into, into your practices, I know some folks out there in the community have with the Linda Berry spiral, think about creating a spiral journal for yourself. If you have a book that you can dedicate to it and do a daily spiral practice, it's kind of cool to look back over the different spirals that happen at different times and you know, whatever days, and just to link them to whatever it was you're experiencing on that day, kind of like an art journal, but a spiral journal. And you can write in it, talk about the process, reflect on it or not. Sometimes just having a visual and nothing else, a visual representation of something without having to justify things or explain things with words can be a pretty brilliant thing. And it can even, make more sense sometimes when you're looking back. Help jog your memory about the day or the week you were having when words in a journal might not do that. Because there's something about art and making art. Permission to not make sense, I think. I think that's something beautiful about what we do sometimes. And to allow that spontaneity 
that whatever to just emerge through whatever we create. But again, not to throw any uh, shade on writing and just a reminder for folks who are out there. And again, welcome everyone. This week we return to our writer's workshop. We took a week, a day off last week for a National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. But Daniel D is back tomorrow morning, Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. for the one hour Zoom writer's workshop where you can just go, it's really super and easy really supportive and non-judgmental, just a space where people can connect and write, uh, explore different creative prompts and things like that. Permission, it's just permission to write. Because a lot of folks I know who enjoy telling stories or writing, creative writing, if it's something you really want to do or have more of in your life, it's difficult to give yourself the space to do it because everything else takes over. So we've made this group specifically for that because in a live stream like this, it might be difficult to write while I'm talking away at you. Um, writing is a slightly different use of our brains, isn't it? So in this Zoom, you get to just be there and be a writer and connect with other folks who want to write or enjoy creative writing themselves as well. No pressure to share your work if you don't want to, but just an opportunity to create. Just a really lovely space to explore language and metaphor and sometimes just be silly and have fun. So back to my junk journal, which might include writing. Maybe this will be a junk journal to hold little bits and pieces and scraps of writing that I do. Who knows? So I was inspired by the thing I made last week and thinking about how I could make a little junk journal out of recycling. And I loved, immediately thought of the Kleenex box idea, partly because of these windows that it has. Um, and I started cutting up the pieces into kind of leaves, like just as you can see here, just kind of like sections that I could stitch together. And then I thought, well, what happens if I just explore the whole Kleenex box in itself? So for example, if I just accordioned this, then, I have this really interesting folding journal that could be bound up all on its own. It was kind of fun. I liked that idea. So I'm going to play with that today. And you know, I know it's not a traditional book size, uh, that it's a little strange and it will probably need to be tied together somehow. And I have a few different ways I like to do that. Let me know if you have a preferred way of binding books. Um, like in traditional, traditional book binding ways or simple or junk journal ways. There's lots of lots of ways to do this. Um, I love using brads, those little, those little metal tabs that you punch through paper that have those little metal wings that fold out and kind of hold, th hold the pages together. I love using those and uh, creating a little kind of, um, I don't know what the word, what would the word be? Uh, just that little anchor to wrap a thread around. The brads are just fun and simple and a really easy, easy way to create that tie for binding a book. And for someone that's impatient like me, that's pretty good, right? No fuss. Oh, and Nicole says, just updates on what you're working on out there. I love updates, folks. Nicole says, I am crocheting a piece that if you, if you hang a dish towel from it, it looks like a dress. <laughs> oh, that's super fun. I'm wondering if that's a, a gift for someone. That's also in the air right now too. When this live stream is living, it's what, it's October, early October, but now is the time of year where people begin to think about holidays, about gifts, about gratitude, giving back. And if you are an arty person, sometimes, not for everyone, some creators I know really don't want to give away handmade gifts. Maybe it's because we might have so much handmade in our own life. We we're concerned that it won't be appreciated in the same way as store-bought. Uh, or perhaps we want to support other artists and makers out there by purchasing their work. And that of course is a wonderful thing. But this time of year, our minds turn towards 
What can we perhaps make for people that might help those people feel special? Remind them of how important they are in our lives. All those lovely little things. And maybe that's a piece of today's theme. Maybe it has something to do with gratitude. Ha ha ha. So Nicole is making this for someone. And Nicole says, the person I'm making it for asked for it. That's lovely. So it's kind of like a commission. And did they come up with the idea or was that your idea? To say, well, this could look like a dress. This could look like a dress. I'm going to make it into a dress. We've got some amazingly imaginative people out there. And Nicole, you're one of those people. So I'm going to trim some of these pieces down. And this is really, again, I'm just making this. I don't really know what I'm doing. Most Wednesdays when I'm in the pop-up art studio, folks who've been watching for a while, you know that I don't normally know what I'm doing. I'm not following any kind of guide or idea of what, how you're supposed to do something. I'm just playing. I'm just gathering these materials and I'm trying things out and seeing what works and what feels good to me. And sometimes that's not such a good idea because I forget to note, like write down, make a note of what does work. And then if I want to recreate it again, I have to go through that, that process of discovering and trial and error all over again. But that's never a bad thing. I think sometimes that's how our practice, whatever we create deepens, just by trying it again and again and again. And as we try, we learn and grow and get better. And that's when technique begins to come into it. And sometimes it's not technique in the way we think of it. It's not someone else's technique that they're passing down to us, something that we're supposed to do because someone else has done it before. It's discovering our own technique. And that is, that's gold. When you can discover your own technique, sort of just click into that groove and understand your own creative voice. That's a beautiful moment. But again, nothing wrong with going by the pattern. And Nicole is saying, it's a pattern. Mm, it's a pattern and there are sewing versions too. Oh, that's awesome. I made her a different dress last year, but she'd like one that matches her kitchen. I love it. And I, you know what? You could take that even one step further. If you created a dress for the person as well as the dish towel. <laughs> That I don't know where that goes. Maybe that's not such a good idea. I don't know the message that means to say. And my, as I was, you know, saying it, I thought, oh, what a lovely idea. And then as I finished saying it, I was like, oh, am I saying that this person is like a dish towel or they dress like a dish towel? But the dish towel is so fantastic. So fantastic. It, yeah, nothing wrong with complimenting it. Do whatever. All of it. All of it. <laughs> do people feel when asked to make something for someone else specific? I often wonder about that because I know sometimes when I chat with artists or makers, folks out there and like the Tuesday live streams and things like that, there is this interesting thing that happens to ourselves when what we create and naturally enjoy doing becomes more of a job. And sometimes with, you know, when friends or loved ones ask us for things, I know sometimes it can feel that way. It can begin to feel like we have to do this. And there's a responsibility and a certain kind of specific accountability that isn't about us. And that's, that can be a weird area to navigate. How do you hold on to the joy of creating and allow yourself to create freely and spontaneously and still create something that, you know, or hope this other person would appreciate. It's an interesting part of an artist's journey. And Nicole, you've been there for a while because you create for a lot of different people. I think one of the things I love about the way you create, and you're probably not alone. I know there must be other folks out there who create this way as well, but there's this generosity of spirit. And all great creative gifts, perhaps that is what's there. This idea of, I love making this and I want to give it. I want to share it with the world. I want to see if other people love this too. And the process of creating imbues that gift. That you know it's something made from the heart. And maybe that's one of the things that makes handmade 
homemade gifts so special? I don't know. And Nicole saying, people wearing dresses made of dish towels. <laughs> the new fashion trend. You know what? That's also been a, a theme recently. And, you know, as today I'm repurposing a Kleenex box, which very much makes me think of Laura Brown, one of our community members who upcycles and repurposes almost everything she comes across into artwork um, in a wonderful way. Um, we have been talking about the different ways to repurpose thing and things and throughout time the thriftiness of, of people, of creative people. And this week and last week with Sandra, we've been talking about how quite often in the past, flower bags and sacks that grain came in, things like that would be repurposed into clothing. So much so that the flower making companies would design special decorative sacks with different fabric and embell like different embellishments design embellishments on them so that people would buy their product specifically so once they knew the flower was done they would use that in creating clothing or quilts and of course rug cooking which i was first introduced to through uh, friends and family down east in canada this idea of reusing burlap sacks and again that idea of repurposing things that weren't traditional art supplies when they first found their way to us and we find a way as humans, wonderful, resilient, creative beings to make it into something else that can be practical, practical and beautiful. So these burlap sacks and things like that would then um, have fabric woven into them, pulled up. So not like a latch hook where the yarn is pulled up to be loose and shaggy, kind of like a shag carpet but just pull through to create a tiny little ridge. And when you have enough of these tiny little ridges all tightly packed together, all different colors of usually clothing that was repurposed, uh, things that couldn't be worn anymore, and just cut up into tiny, tiny, tiny little strips to be pulled through the weave of the burlap, you'd have these beautiful, extraordinary rugs. And Wendy, hello, Wendy, when walking, when out walking lately, Wendy says, I have been picking up interesting sticks, moss, leaves. Now I am trying to build a small fairy house out of them. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. And in fact, that's one of the kits we might have to give out through the Mobile Art Hive. We have, um, I know it was Mama Sandy, someone in the community, Mama Sandy donated some kits that they'd made and I think we're going to embellish them and share them with people this year this um, as we go out into the community but you know what like you Wendy we're gonna have to find some natural things to include in them and now's the time before the snow hits oh 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 <laughs> and Laura is out there too hello Laura as living room saying oh talking about rug cooking latch hook yes Laura and being inspired to create things you must have, your ears must have been burning. I was talking about you as I'm creating this junk journal out of an old Kleenex box because for a while I was holding on to Kleenex boxes and I had so many of them that I finally thought I can't keep all of these. So I let some of them go. Today, I'm regretting it because I think there's really cool things we can do with them. Oh, <laughs> exactly. There's that moment. And I think all of us who collect and you know have an eye for things that can be used as like used in art or as art or things that have potential we don't know quite yet how we want to use them but we think oh, no I want to hold on to that and sometimes there comes a time where you need to let things go take stock reorganize process and let go of stuff and there's always one thing there's always one thing that we let go we let go and then we look for it and we realize, oh no, I gave it away. There's always one little regret, or at least that's the way it is for me usually. Now I'm just poking a hole while I can in this because if I, uh, as I was mentioning, I'm going to use that for a little, for a little brad, but if I, I don't know how much I'm gonna paint or collage over this, so I wanna make that hole so I remember it, that it's there. And actually, as while we're on that subject, Let's find out where I want to put the other hole because sometimes I forget about that. Oh, it's going to need to go here. So this will be a two brad junk journal. Sometimes I forget to mark where I want these pieces to be. 
and get through the project. I have to kind of improvise, but today at least, no matter where this ends up, I'll have that as a mark. Okay, yeah, all right. So next steps, what do I want to do here? Hmm, good question, Mary. I have some paint out because I thought I wanted to paint. Now I'm wondering if I should lay over some tissue paper or some scrapbooking paper. What do you think, folks? What should I do today? Should I paint? Should I scrapbook? What should I do to decorate this Kleenex box junk journal? I covered it with a layer of tissue paper just to make the surface a little more giving in case I wanted to paint. So, you know what? Let's start there. Let's start there and see where it takes us. Let me just cover up that pointy bit on my awl again before I forget. And Nicole said, I had some fairy lights that I never used. Turns out my niece loves them. Oh, nothing like a good string of fairy lights. At the studio, we managed to collect so many of them. Um, of course, they're usually donated, so they don't always work, but we use them in so many different ways, in so many different events. And with the Mobile Art Hive, we're probably going to be using them, um, LED ones, to help decorate and light the Mobile Art Hive, too. Because we didn't have new lighting put in. We had some light bulbs replaced in the pre-existing light that the school bus had, but it's still not very bright. But I didn't want to put in anything that was just fluorescent and big and garish, and I wanted to live with it a little bit live with the bus to see how dark it got in there and what kind of work light we needed to manage things. But I have a feeling, I have a feeling we're gonna be using a lot of fairy lights. I like the warmth of that. I like the idea that, that we can have a kind of softness to the light. Once the daylight goes away, It'll feel warm, it'll feel toasty, and I like the idea of it feeling a little magical. Oh, Wendy, thinking about you out there collecting those beautiful, beautiful natural pieces. If you see anything interesting for us that you can hold on to, <laughs> let us know. Keep some for us. And actually that is a genuine shout out. We do have about half a big bin of pine cones left, but I think this season we're going to have some workshop kits involving pine cone craft. So if anyone is out there in a place where there just happens to be lots of uh, funky pine cones, not funky as in smelly, like funky as in just cool shapes, sturdy enough to work with, won't disintegrate too easily. Maybe pine cones that can be painted or, you know, have, different things adhered to them, stuck onto them, whether we're making like a little bird seed hanger for a tree, or perhaps, you know, laying on the glitter. We, you know, our communities, people love glitter. Uh, if you see any pine cones and you can pick up a bag or two for us, I'd love to have some. Now that I've said that, I'm hoping we're not gonna get like thousands of pounds of pine cones, but you know, it'll be fine. We'll find a use for them. And in fact, some folks out there have done some really interesting things with fairy lights and pine cones, kind of stringing them together, wrapping them with wire as a garland, painting them, and then wrapping the lights around the pine cones. And it becomes a beautiful, like fairly simple, lovely uh, decoration. Just something beautiful for this season where we're beginning to bring, or look for ways of bringing the outdoors inside again. And <laughs> Laura's saying, yay, a mission. I made Xmas trees with Emily's, oh, senior kindergarten class, pom-poms and glitter. Was that, no, I guess that's not recent. Uh, or maybe it was. Yeah, pom-poms and glitter. There's, yeah, I mean, they're, they're sparkly, sparkly. That's who, what's not to love about sparkly, sparkly and soft. All right. Make some space, Mara. Come, come, come. There we go. So what am I going to start with? I'm going to start with this. I'm just going to start layering on. 
Again, not thinking too much, just gonna be spontaneous here and see where this takes me. Whenever I acrylic paint, it's one of the reasons why I wore a sweatshirt today because I was just aware of, well, if I'm gonna paint, I know it's gonna end up on me. <laughs> Some point in the live stream, I'm gonna forget and I will walk away covered in paint. And that's okay. But yeah, the seasonal crafts, looking for ways to hold on to the outdoors a little bit longer before it gets a little too cold to spend more time outdoors. Mm. Oh, Emily says, oh, so that garland that or the trees, the pom-pom glitter trees were made in 2015. Yeah, that was a long time ago. That was the beginning of, of, yeah, we would have just been opened at the studio space at 149. But it is that time of year, folks. If you're looking, when you're out there on your walks, and if you see something beautiful that catches your eye, a beautiful piece of stick, like a stick or a piece of driftwood or pine cones. I've also seen people do really, really beautiful things with maple keys. Beautiful, simple things with maple keys. Little dragonflies and things like that. Now's the time to grab it. I think last year I regretted not having more natural pieces on me. It's one of those things sometimes, giving ourselves enough time to collect and permission to gather. I think there's always that impulse, well, we can do it later. There's gonna be enough time to do it later. And there's always time for something. That's one of the things about art that I, I love. It's a very forgiving kind of thing because it can be a very forgiving thing. It's a good place to be. It's a good place to begin nurturing that relationship, building boundaries with your inner critics. Because I think if you can get to a place where you can remind yourself, oh, it's okay that that didn't happen today, or it's okay that I didn't collect that or grab that when I saw it, instead of kicking yourself, that's a really healthy place to be. And you discover new things, of course. But on that same note, it's pine cone season, folks. <laughs> and Nicole says, I went to Michael's yesterday. I bought some yarn as usual. It is, yeah, we're beginning to nest and gather, surrounding ourselves with supplies, things to tempt us into creativity. What are some folks, what are some of your favorite, favorite supplies to have around you? What do you turn to? What is the, like, your one go-to thing that you can't be without. Inquiring minds want to know. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. Sometimes it's the simplest things, but usually we have that one comfort piece that we return to, that one comfort supply or tool, the thing that helps us, you know, when nothing else will, it's the one thing that might inspire us or get us into making. There's so many really cool things out there that we can create with. And there are amazing, like, just thinking about all the different things that people have been talking about lately, like all the different die cut machines, things, you know, there are many different brands, so I don't necessarily, I won't necessarily talk about the brands, but machines that we can invest quite a lot of money in that help us do things that we could still do with a pair of scissors or X-Acto knife. We might not be able to do as much. But I don't know if, I think we'd be fine without those things too. I think we'd survive. Sometimes I need to remind myself of that when I begin feeling that, oh, I should have that. No matter what we have, creativity doesn't need anything fancy. And sometimes there are those things that just help boost us, that we just love to have on hand, the things that make us feel good. For me, I don't know what I would do without a needle and thread. 
I went through a long time without a needle and thread, I think, in years where I was at school or studying, and I just didn't have one to hand. I didn't think it was something that I needed. Of course, now, mending, stitching, sewing, just knowing that I have that there, it's one of those things I love. And Wendy says, oh, interesting. Wendy says, I need cutlery and jewelry pieces around me. I can see that. I can totally see that. And folks that who don't know Wendy's work, uh, and Wendy, you can they, Wendy can be found at One Hummingbird Lane on Insta and all the places. Beautiful jewelry, repurposed, upcycled, transformed from things that you know maybe other people have thrown away, things that are out of style, things that you know are slightly broken or damaged or just unloved. Wendy transforms them into beautiful, magical, wearable works of art. And in fact, I was just talking to Wendy about that the other day too on on their on your YouTube channel, the unboxing videos that we ha you have, like e exploring the recent purchases or finds. It's lovely and relaxing to watch an unboxing video, but it's also really exciting to imagine what you are going to create with those things. But it's, there's a comfort to having those at hand, knowing that you can reach for them when you need them and you won't be without, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be something fancy. And Laura is saying through the living room, fabric, thread, buttons, paper, scissors, glue. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what? It sounds like a lot when I read it out loud, but that's not actually. And I think most of us, I mean, yeah, fabric, thread, buttons, paper, scissors, and glue. With those things, you can do so much, so much. I think I'm the same. I think thread, needle and thread, but along with that comes a pair of scissors. And it's, I should check myself because not everyone has those things. As I was mentioning in a period of my life, I didn't. But now just knowing that they're there brings me that comfort. And Nicole said, ah, oh, interesting. Nicole says, I had a big nostalgic moment yesterday. I found the first knitting book I ever bought online. It was so nice to see. Oh, and so nice to see Clut still sells the instruction kit. So that's good, especially with those kits and things we buy online. You never quite know if something, you know, will be a trend, a fad. It's nice to see they still support it that you can still continue to use that kit, those instructions, those, that book that you purchased. Finding a, yeah, sometimes finding a really good instruction manual or book, like a guide to something. I love a lot of the older ones that are out there. And when I see them, I snap them up. For folks who, for example, there used to be a time, not so much anymore because we have YouTube and Pinterest and you know, all the things. But once upon a time, people, you know, would create like recipe cards. I think some of us probably have these boxes of recipe cards and they made craft and art versions of these as well. Mine, the ones I have are from the 60s and 70s, late, you know, around that period. And you could just pull these cards out and you have all these ideas of how to step-by-step -step instructions to make these weird. <laughs> and wonderful uh, craft ideas and, and sometimes they're quite quite detailed there's one that I was looking at the other day for batik and I just think I don't know if I'm ready for batik I think this is such a it's like an investment to create through with those you know you need these tools and this very specific supplies and a space to create in but I love having those that reference there to look at. And it's very different for me. I don't know if it is for you to hold a card, the physical media, um, as opposed to going online to look at something. I love that we have this virtual space and that we can look online for things and search things. But I do love a good resource, a book or a card or a zine, something that has just stored. I think that's another thing that I don't, you know, another comfort thing for me is books, having books around. Um, and Laura saying, yes, fabric requires thread and buttons are an extra. Paper can be used alone though. Absolutely. I think you can use the fabric on the paper. 
You can use the paper with the fabric in some cases as well. You can stitch them together. Both can be used as fibers because they are fibrous, each in their own special way. Hmm. The things, the comfort supplies, the comfort supplies that we love. And Nicole saying it was really dated though. So the book that you loved, that you found, that you were happy that was still, you could still find the supplies for, um, really dated though since it held a cell phone case pattern, but for a cell phone from eight years ago. Now, isn't that funny? That's, yeah. To think about how quickly things can change now and how quickly trends and things just, that just seemed so important and so necessary to have are now obsolete. It's like finding some of the old craft books I have from the 60s and 70s have a lot of crafts for children that use cigarette packets. And that's something you just don't see these days. And I think that's, I think there's, that's a good thing. <laughs> And no judgment for anyone out there who smokes. I smoked for a time. But it's definitely... Crafts using cigarette packets just aren't that common these days. And I think, again, it's another reflection of the times. Things that we don't need anymore, don't use anymore. So those cell phone patterns, those cell phone case patterns... Books like that tell a story. But you never know. Who knows? There might come a time where we find those patterns fit something else. Or perhaps we'll come to a time where we repurpose all those old phones. I don't know. Stranger things have happened. For those of us who got rid of all of our, own, like our old records, and now, of course, we wish we still had them. Or for those of us who got rid of our CDs because we thought, ah, everything's going to be online now forever. It'll be fine. And now we realize, well, if there's only one way I can listen to that story, that musical story told from beginning to end. Something special. Physical media does have a place. But you just never know. And oh, Laura's saying, I really want to try Batik one day. Oh, future workshop? Whew, maybe. You know, that's a workshop uh, similar to the Fantastic Critical Mass. That is a workshop where I think we'd have to bring in someone who was a Batik artist and perhaps get a grant to have them share the process with everyone, demonstrate, and then over a period of time, work us through that. Because it, it does require all these very sp specific tools, but there must be a simplified Batik process and I think talking to and meeting connecting with the artists will have an opportunity to learn about that as well so that's you're catching up with my brain a little bit there and things that I'm hoping for as we move forward with the mobile art hive perhaps getting some artist in resident grants going connecting with different artists for very specific things that can enrich our community and different ways and uh, Laura again saying um, Emily made yep yeah, we're talking about repurposing things that aren't necessarily easy to find anymore and things that perhaps children maybe shouldn't be making crafts with uh, Emily made a little desk drawer from a smoke pack she got from my friend that's it right I remember again and I age myself and I am proud of my age just as I am of my scars, I have survived and I have stories to tell. And every wrinkle, every gray hair is testament to that. Um, but when I was little, I, no one in my family smoked, but all of these cigarette pack crafts in these books, I so, so badly wanted to make a tiny set of drawers using cigarette packs. Isn't that funny? But no one I knew smoked. So for the longest time, I was like, it was just one of those things as a child that I really, really wanted to do, not having any idea what smoking really was, not having, like, not living with anyone who smoked. And as I got older and realized, oh, this is what this is. Hmm. 
But I'm glad, I mean, that's a lovely thing. I'm glad M was able to make something creative out of something, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, bleach bottle crafts, things like that, where you get the sense there was a point in time and where they just said here, and they just handed a bleach bottle to a child and said, make something with it. Again, not necessarily a bad thing. Just we do things a little different now. We try to do things differently now. Safety first, everyone. Safety first. <laughs> and again, of course, like this is here where we are at and other places in the world. I'm sure there's so many other different things that they have um, that we don't get to see. Ways of creating materials that are created with because there's just a surplus of them. One day, wouldn't that be a fantastic thing to do, to take, to travel, to see a travel, like a traveling to see the upcycled art of the world. That would be a lovely thing to do. That's something nice to dream about. something else that brings me comfort to the idea of traveling something that often happens through art for me or craft or you know you know how I feel about the word craft folks I feel like it's somewhat marginalizing because oftentimes what a traditional fine arts worlds things they might call craft or they divide up into very specific categories and oftentimes maybe unintentionally it marginalizes things that are created or made by women, by people of color, by differently abled neurodiverse individuals in our communities. It gets called craft instead of art, or it gets called folk art or naive art. And in my mind, of course, it's just art. Why don't we just call it what it is? It's art. You might like it, you might not like it. You might want to buy it, you might not want to buy it, but it's art, it's art. High art, low art, all the art. That is another art hive principle. Because what rings your bell may not ring someone else's bell. But that's the whole point of it. It's the story that's told and what resonates with each of us. But anyways, yes, back to the conversation. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Nicole saying, I have a pattern book with a whole bunch of toilet paper, soap bottle and kettle covers. Wait. So let me get this right. So the book is just about covers for these things, making covers for all of these things. Yeah, okay, I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> there was definitely a period of time where we were obsessed with covering things. Again, we're going down this interesting nostalgia comfort path today. Um, yeah, we were obsessed with covering things as a culture, covering our toilet rolls, covering, well, tea, teapots, that makes sense. Keeping the teapot warm absolutely makes sense. But there was a, a time when we were just like, cover it. Don't let anyone see that we have toilet paper or, or that we have cleaning supplies or that the chairs have legs. Cover the chair legs, everyone. We're interesting as human beings, as creatures go. <laughs> we're definitely interesting. Oh, hello, Shelly, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, I almost forgot to paint that. And I'm going to give that, let's do something different there. Give that a yellow. And I make jokes about things like that. But of course, there was probably very good reasons why. Society, culture, if you could call it culture, felt the need to hide certain things. Or maybe it was just a... Perhaps it gave purpose to the creativity. Maybe that's as simple as that is. Maybe it, it helped give permission to someone to make something because somewhere in their mind they thought, well, it'll, it'll be used. Because we do have that issue, don't we? As, as, as uh, humans, another weird, interesting human thing, a quirk, where it's very difficult sometimes to create something without it being used specifically for something practical. We might feel it's a waste of time. It's a waste of our energy. Those phrases, we use a lot. We use those phrases 
if you think about all the times you've said it to yourself or you've had someone in your life maybe say it to you or perhaps say it to themselves. A waste of your energy. This is a waste of my time. What do we really mean when we're saying that? We're kind of marginalizing that creative, that creative energy. Because you never know unless you try. You never know what something will turn into. So perhaps all of those things, those practical things, making covers for, well, making cover for the toaster, I suppose that served a purpose as well, maybe. Yeah, okay, it makes sense now. Yeah, yeah. But it's again, all this, this uh, kind of comes back to the permission we give ourselves to create. But of course, a lot of these practical art forms like rug cooking, for example, just bringing it back there. Beautiful, like these beautiful practices to create practical things for your house, for your family, eventually they found their way into the fine art world, didn't they? So perhaps it's one way of ensuring that our voice gets out there and ensuring that people see what we do and find value in what we do so that we can take it to the next level, so that we can experiment and explore it. It's interesting. And Nicole saying, ah, oh, the pattern book is for things to sell at craft shows. Yeah, that makes sense. So for like long, long time at craft shows and maybe still even, we do see things like that, like toilet paper covers and toilet, yeah, like it's just, I find it very amusing and delightful and charming. And um, yeah, there's something very special about that period of time where that was the thing that people made for craft shows. And Wendy says, I remember there were patterns for vacuum covers. Right, okay, so it's, yeah. Why? <laughs> but again, I suppose it helped keep things tidy in some way, just keeping the dust off of everything. Don't let dust touch anything. If someone from that period of time were to enter into where I live right now, they would be horrified. They would be horrified. No covers for anything, dust everywhere. Dust in my artwork, just dust everywhere. <laughs> and there, you know, to be fair, there is a lot of dust on my vacuum as well. It's one of those things that sometimes I try to vacuum my vacuum to clean it off and it doesn't quite work. So maybe, Wendy, maybe, maybe I need a vacuum cleaner cover. Nicole, I'll talk. I'll, well, you know what? I'll reach out to community. If you have a pattern for a vacuum cleaner cover, let me know. <laughs> and Nicole's referring to, in that book, they had poodle soap, uh, <laughs> poodle soap and kettle cozies. These things make me smile. And it's also this connection to people of our past that probably everyone, each one of us has in our family, somewhere along the line, no matter how young, how old you are, you've probably had someone in your family create something like this, purchase something like this. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely, lovely thing. And Shelly saying chair covers, Exactly, right? Chair covers to keep the dust off the chairs, not just to hide the legs. <laughs> Although at one time that was a very specific thing, apparently. Okay, so what am I doing? Yeah, so this will be... All right, got it. Inside and out. And, uh, Laura saying through the living room, oh, the dust is here too. Oh, good to know that I'm not the only one. Good to know. I suspect there's a lot more of us out there. We don't talk about dust very much, do we? Uh, so Laura says, yes, I have a, oh, so Laura, Nicole, Laura has a poodle uh, toilet paper cover <laughs> that someone uh, knitted for you. That's, oh, you see, gifts made with love. And it somehow feels, I don't know if this is the case, but it's interesting to consider if it helps us make practical gifts for people. If it somehow feels easier to justify, safer to do. Right? Maybe that just enables 
it gives permission to create, permission to create and permission to give. If it's something that we know or hope that someone will use in a practical way. And any, any way people get to there to get like any way we get to creating and making and expressing ourselves, I'll take it. I'm all for it. Once we get to those places, and people discover what they love and what they want to do more of, then we can have those conversations about, okay, what do you want to do with this? Now that you are aware of your creative voice, what kind of stories do you want to tell? Who do you want to listen to those stories? I think that's part of the process of realizing who you are as a creator and realizing that your voice has potential and power to make change. But it doesn't always happen all at once. And I think if we have a hard time doing those things with words, then we might feel extra intimidated to do it through our art. It's not impossible, but sometimes art is the best place to do that. People respond to art and open their hearts to art in the way, in ways that they don't off, they don't always do for words. Right? Comfort, nostalgia, the things we love to have at hand, and hopefully we'll always have at hand. I think it's one of the reasons why I distrust fancy tools and equipment, if I'm honest. Because you, I guess I don't trust that they'll always be around. But there are things, needle and thread, right? Always be here. Pine cones, paint, journal to hold your thoughts. I find comfort in those things, knowing that they'll be there. And perhaps also in a digital age, there's comfort in knowing that I won't necessarily become obsolete. If there's a way for me to express what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, then I won't become obsolete. And maybe that's part of that fear. Oh, hello. Hello, paper. I'll have to revisit you. And isn't that one of the reasons why we make art in the first place? To make our, our make a mark, to show the world in some way. I was here. The very, very beginning when I was given the spiel, you know, that's, you know, when we say that creativity is a part of our birthright, that it's every human is born creative. That's part of it, isn't it? That there is this drive in us, this... this desire to make sense, to make meaning of all of this. And art is sometimes the simplest way of doing that. To be able to say, I was here, I did this, I experienced this. You don't know who will remember you once, you know, once we've shuffled off this mortal coil, so to speak. But what we create remains and will hopefully be viewed, be used with great compassion and appreciation, acknowledged in some way, even if what we've created is a poodle toilet roll cover, because sometimes those are the things that we feel drawn to. And if you feel drawn to those things, especially if they've been handmade, one of those lovely, lovely things too about stumbling across things in thrift shops, jumble sales, whatever you like to call them, is knowing that another human being at a certain point shaped this and it brought them joy for this moment in time. Although I do also love playing the game of looking at things at Value Village and asking myself, the person who painted that, did they love what they were painting? 
Was that a pleasurable experience for them, or did someone make them paint that sunset? Sometimes I think, I have no, no expertise, no reason to say this, but sometimes I, I do look at things and think, hmm, that wasn't made with love. <laughs> that was made... <laughs> that was made for a different reason. I may not know why or what went into that, but I don't think it was love. <laughs> That's just me, though. <laughs> That's just me. And Shelley saying, Okay, yeah, be sure to visit the Oshawa Market. This is the old Pickering Flea Market with over 300 vendors. So we're along on that theme of supporting local artists, local makers, local vendors, people, you know, sharing what they love with the world. And sometimes at these markets, I know it's not handmade items. Sometimes it's things that people love, things to help make, you know, make ends meet for people. We're selling things to pay the rent and that's okay too somebody else that needs them that's okay no shame in that um but yeah the old pickering flea market has moved to oshawa so folks are familiar with oshawa it will be where the old zellers or kmart used to be someone might have an address there that's how i reference that i know it's not the most helpful thing and for folks who are watching now or once we're archived maybe you don't this is maybe not a thing for you at all <laughs> But maybe you have your own flea markets or your own places that you turn to, that you go to, to find interesting things or to support your local small businesses and vendors and things like that. I hope, Shelley, I truly hope that the flea market is affordable enough that local like makers, DIY people, perhaps can find stalls there to uh, sell their work as well. I know they're not always within the right price range for artists, but it would be great if they provided opportunities for indie makers. That would be a really lovely thing. But I guess we'll find out. Each flea market has its own flavor, doesn't it? Each, each market has its own personality. And another great reason why people explore them, to learn more about what their community looks like. I have I have a lot of memories of going to the Pickering Flea Market. Not a lot. I have I have some. And that was when, you know, as a kid growing up in Scarborough, when we used to go to the Pickering Flea Market, it was my friend's family who used to take me and they were big flea market people. And it felt like an adventure. Just because it wasn't something that was in my neighborhood. It was just a really fun, exciting thing to do, to be exposed to new things and new sights, new smells. To feel like there was something there for everyone and maybe you'd find something and find a treasure for yourself. And it's exciting that that's coming back and that it's coming to Oshawa. So thanks for the reminder, Shelley. Thanks so much. And October 16th is the day where it opens again. Okay, fantastic. Watch for that day, folks. Hello, Sandra. And Sandra popping in for a little bit to say hello to everyone. And a good reminder to me. And Jacqueline. Hey, Jacqueline. And Jacqueline saying hi to Sandra. It's good to see you here. Oh, and Jacqueline saying lovely to hear my voice. <sighs> I'm going to imagine your voice for a moment. And the ukulele. Your ukulele playing. So that I can say the same to you. Lovely to hear your voice. Lovely. Lovely to reconnect again. Thank you for saying hi. <laughs> and Shelly's saying, my friends are made, oh, made from love. My friends are made from love of what she does. Now, I know you have some very creative people. You are a creative person and you have some creative people in your life who love what they create, what they sell. I know that Crystal, I wonder, is Crystal having a market, uh, having a stall there? That would be interesting. You don't need to answer right now. Just think it out loud. We'll probably find a lot of familiar faces there sharing what they do and you know these are interesting times I think all of us can understand that how we get by in the world changes day to day so if we can support someone local or support uh, an artist or maker doing their thing doing it from the heart with love why wouldn't we want to do that, right? And of course, in the flea market, 
I think all of us have that little thrill, knowing, hoping, what if I find a treasure? <laughs> Treasures for everyone. And <laughs> Jacqueline saying, oh my God, funny you should say that, Mary. I literally just came home from uke practice. I knew it. Maybe I sensed it. No, I, I don't have that power. Uh, but first time in a few years we could play in person. Oh, how lovely to hear that, Jacqueline. Oh, that's lovely. That's one uh, thing I miss. I miss that quite a lot from the studio of like, hearing people play music, whether they're playing the piano or the guitars or the ukuleles. I do miss that very, very much. And I'm hoping that with the Mobile Art Hive, there'll be some opportunities to invite people out from time to time, depending again on everything. Uh, safety first and <laughs> warmth first. But I'm hoping that we can be a place-making kind of experience to gather the creative people together to do what they love and music. You need music. We all need music in our lives in some way, some time of the day. Music makes things better. I'm speaking for myself here, but music just makes things better. And if you're lucky enough, like Jacqueline to play ukulele, how awesome is that? You can make your own music. That's, that's something that a skill I don't have yet. And Sandra is saying, I remember when the flea market was at the Pickering Mall. That's what we were talking about, Sandra. Interesting how these businesses, they travel, they, they, they move, don't they migrate? And I think sometimes it's a sign of the times and spaces gentrifying, cities gentrifying. And I, you know, I don't know for sure, but I imagine there was some of that in, in Pickering. And perhaps the flea market just outgrew where it was at, maybe. Yeah, maybe it was a, they needed to find a larger space. Maybe they got priced out, who knows? But I suppose their loss is Oshawa's gain and it, we will see a lot of people coming from all over because that was a very popular one. I just, I do hope they make space for indie artists and makers. That would be that would be a lovely thing. So you could kind of go there and get a one-stop feel for everything. And, uh, yes, and, oh, Jacqueline's saying, I love the musical rhymes of your paintbrush. It's interesting, I look up from time to time and I'll see this, because there's a little bit of a delay where I'm at. And I'll just see this mad flying stick going across the screen. It is a little musical, isn't it? <laughs> and of course the sounds too. There's something, as I was mentioning in the beginning in my warm up, there's something really lovely about being in the creative flow and noticing, noticing things like the sound of the paintbrush or the pen or the, you know, whatever it is you're using on the paper canvas, you know, etc., etc. The scissors cutting the paper or the fabric. Just the different kind of sensory information we gather from the creative process. It's a beautiful thing. Of course, I'm here talking, talking your ears off. So you might not get to hear and appreciate all of those things. And Jackie's saying, yes, ow, oh, excellent. And our indigenous drumming resumed last week in person. Some small, yep, some small pieces of normalcy. It is a really lovely thing where I think, I mean, who am I to say, but I'm hoping we're in a place where we can begin to identify what we really want to hold on to and find ways of doing it as safely as we can moving forward feeling confident and aware and anticipating one another's needs. Um, but if we are gonna be in this weird place for a while, then how can we reclaim that for ourselves and bring in that lovely, healthy, creative connection in ways that are manageable and safe for everyone? And just restoring that sense of community. I'm glad to hear, I'm so glad to hear that, Jackie. That's wonderful to hear. Wonderful to hear. And it's good for everyone else to know out there too. I don't know, you know, for folks who are local, Jackie, if, if 
the drumming circle is accepting new people or if there's a way people can appreciate what's created. Would it be worth sharing the link to who they are in the chat just so people can look them up and learn a little bit more about it? There's a lot of folks out there who would love to learn about drumming or drumming circles and get more involved with that process. Oh, and Jackie's saying, video keeps cutting out. Anyone else having a problem with the feed? You know what, if you are having problems with that, it's not uncommon. It happens from time to time, and depending on a lot of factors. Uh, just be patient if you can. Thanks for your patience, folks. And if you're somewhere where that keeps happening, hang in there. And if it gets really bad, you can always come on back later once it's been archived and catch up then. And Shelly confirming, yes, Crystal will be a vendor at that market. So good to hear. And Wendy says, the flea market moved out of the mall when stores started being open on Sundays. That's right. So Sandra, that's like, Sandra taking us back to that. And I'd forgotten that it was in the mall. And Wendy reminding us of just the history of why it changed locations. That's interesting. I've forgotten about that piece. That's right, it was once upon a time. The flea market was the only thing you could do on a Sunday. And for younger viewers out there, that's something that used to be. Only a very, a very limited amount of things that you could do on a Sunday. And now there's everything in the world you can do on a Sunday, pretty much. But I think a lot of folks miss having a little more structure, a little more limitation, fewer choices. Choice is always a good thing. But sometimes it can feel overwhelming when there's so much, so much to choose from. And Jackie's saying, have to get supper started as I'm off to Ajax later for a church meeting. But when I saw you were online, wanted to pop on, spread some smiles here. Be safe and be well all. Oh, thank you, Jackie. So great. Thanks for dropping in and saying hi. And for those folks who are interested, it's all our relations Métis drumming circle. So if it's something you've been thinking about, or perhaps you might be Métis as well, or learning more about Métis culture, wanting to appreciate or support, this is a great opportunity to learn about them. I think you can look them up online. I believe they have a Facebook group. Check them out, show them some love and learn about some of the awesome things that we have going on out there in our community. And if you're out there watching and you're not in Durham region, that's okay too. Of course it is. There might be some resources in your area that you'd like to share as well. You know, feel free to plop them in the links too. You know, put, share, the, share those resources with everyone. And if you're familiar with the Wednesday live stream, of course, you know that after every live stream, I put up a show and tell piece and just give folks an opportunity to share pictures of what they've been working on or links to things that have inspired their work or perhaps your art isn't on, like isn't visual art. So you might want to link to a Tumblr or a website or an Etsy page. You're more than welcome to do that there. So if anyone wants to follow up around, usually I, I get it up around 3.45 or 4 p.m. Put in your information, share what you do with the world, share what you love with the world. And don't be afraid to kind of highlight some of that creativity for people and for yourself. Interesting, yeah. It's interesting how communities change. And Shelley reminding us that that property was <sighs> bought out by a certain super shipping magnet. <laughs> it's times, you know, everything changes, everything evolves. And I think that's one of the reasons why we end up having conversations like this to remind ourselves of the things, um, just to touch, just to look back and reflect about the things that we remember so that we can mark the passing of time, kind of mark these moments in our lives and re-spark these memories, the things that are meaningful for us. And the, even if it's not so meaningful, it's, it's a lovely thing to visit. It's, traveling without being, you know, having to leave your house to go back and to remember, to call up these images, these experiences from our past, and to realize that everything changes, everything grows, everything moves on. And it's a lovely thing to appreciate the things 
when we have them here, it's a good reminder to appreciate those things. And he, wow, yes. So Laura reminding us too, it used to be church and the Stouffville flea market when Laura was growing up. Pickering flea on Brock when, when I was, was when I was a bit older, would go with my friends, always got black balls with the anise seed in the middle and sugar cane. Oh, wow. Again, sensory things, huh? The black balls with the anise. I remember, the, oh, those were, those are good. Yeah, wow. Certain things taking you back. Taking me back, anyways. Oh my goodness, is it 325? People, it's 325. How did that time just fly, fly by? Okay. So then, I'm surprised. I looked up and I, I thought I had a good 20 minutes left, but I don't. So, this will have to be a work in progress, like so many of my other pieces. But I am excited about where it's at. So it's taken me a little longer to paint it. I hope you've enjoyed watching just the colors unfold across the screen. And of course, this to me is like watercolor doodling. I love mixing and mashing colors and just doing it in a spontaneous way and not thinking about it too, too much. But I'll give you a little sense. I think the next step for me here, we'll be using some stencils to create some texture on this. I might, when this is dry, glue down some of these to create pockets in the book so I can stash some things. These, I might attach some, maybe some other papers, papers, maybe accordion sheets so that to more, like for more junk journaling or maybe, maybe images, maybe mini collages. I remember at the beginning I mentioned this could be a writer's junk journal for myself, but maybe I can make it into a little collage junk journal telling a little story of its own. And these, I think, well, yeah, will be little wings with additional pages that fold out as well. And that's a great thing about a junk journal is that you can, it can grow with you over time. So you don't have to have everything perfect and complete right away. It's nice to get it to a place where you can use it and learn how you want to use it. And then as you learn what you need, you can adapt it. So you can add other pages, you can add new pockets, you learn about what this journal means to you and make it your own over time. And that's what makes them really beautiful and special too. Sometimes things are, if they're too perfect right from the very start, I have a hard time using them. I don't want to mess them up. I don't want to make them a part of my everyday life. I'd like this, something like this to be a part of my everyday life. So that's what I do. I allow it. I give permission for it to be imperfect. And I let all the other wonderful things that we've been talking about inform the process of how it's made and what I want to do with it as well. So maybe this will have something to do with comfort. Maybe this will have something to do with nostalgia. Maybe this will have something to do <laughs> with flea markets. Who knows? But I think what we have here is something that's interesting. It's in an interesting place. If I had a Brad, do I have one hanging around somewhere? Usually there's so much stuff here. It's not uncommon for me to find something that I need. And Laura, you're right. Pockets, pockets are the best. And you know what? Looky here, I do have a Brad hanging around. So I'll pop that in there. Do, 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 do. do I have a piece of yarn I can use? just to kind of show the effect. Oh, I must. There we go. There's so much behind this desk off camera, so much stuff. I seriously need to do a good, I need to have a good tidy. But the general idea, the general gist of it is, <laughs> and finding us on the subject of finding random art supplies hopefully when you needed them Laura's saying I just found a brad in the bottom of a purse I cleaned out yesterday you never know when you'll need a brad a good paper fastener you just you know what they come in so handy so just to show you what I'm kind of imagining and I'll put another paper fastener there once it dries as well and let's see here again work in progress not 
perfect by any means. Definitely interesting. But a good start. That's too long. What was I thinking? But that gives you a little idea, a little sense of what I'm thinking about. Right? And what can be done with it. And maybe this little window here, I'll put in that can. I might even find, uh, lay in some tissue paper so that little window, the Kleenex box window is filled with an image that's kind of transparent, perhaps, so you can see through, have some of that red and the yellow coming through the other image that's laid over top. Yeah. There's so much we can do with repurposing things. And that is the truth. And you never know. You never know until you try. So next time you're getting ready to throw out, throw out that Kleenex box or you know what, as we were saying, if you are a smoker and you have cigarette packs, you might want to turn them into something. I mean, why not? Why not? What a wonderful and interesting time it's been, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. And thank you so much to everyone who's been watching after it's been archived as well. I know you couldn't join us for the live, but that's okay. I feel your energy and I appreciate your energy as well. Thanks to everyone who dropped by for a few minutes here and there to visit to say hi and to absorb the Art Hive energy. This reminds me, this kind of conversation reminds me of the conversations we used to have in the studio on a rainy, kind of chilly autumn day. Maybe we put on a second batch of coffee in the afternoon and it was quiet and just hanging out, sitting at the tables, making art and remembering all the things we loved, remembering all the things we didn't love, but reconnecting with that sense of where we've come from and how we got to where we are right now. And it's a very special kind of thing if you can pull on those threads of positivity from your past, especially on days where you're feeling a little dark or grumpy or itchy or scratchy, you can pull on those threads of warmth from your past to weave something new for yourself today. That's a, that's a lovely little thing. And I think nostalgia, that bittersweet sense of nostalgia works its best magic when we can do that with, when it, with it, when it's not just about sitting and dwelling upon the past, but we can, use those memories to spark new things today for ourselves and for our community. So that's that. Thank you for taking me back down a little bit of memory lane and letting me into some of the things that help you feel comfort through your art making and all those lovely supplies that you might have on hand or not have on hand. Hopefully we'll have the mobile art hive out there soon in this community here so we can begin connecting with people in person again. But until that happens, we'll still be connecting online and we're gonna continue connecting online through the fall and to December. So don't, don't worry. Still gonna be here for you Wednesdays. And if you haven't had a chance yet, folks, check out the new fall schedule. It just kind of affirms some of the things that we've been doing so far that we're gonna continue doing. And we've shaken up some of the scheduling. So wellness group is now on Mondays. We have a new but familiar live stream happening on Tuesday nights as well. Don't forget Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. We have the Writer's Workshop Zoom with Danielle as well. So there's so many options. If you do like creating from the comfort of your own home space, we got you covered. Um, but yeah, we hope to be out there soon in person again as well. And <laughs> Laura remembering. Oh, oh, thank you, Laura. Laura commenting on the journal. Like it. Great colors and very sturdy. A good traveler. Art on the go. That is a perfect way of describing this kind of junk journal. Something sturdy, art on the go. I love that. You know I love that, Laura. And <laughs> all the nostalgia crafts from weird and slightly inappropriate things from my childhood. Smoke pack foil balls. Remember them. You know what? That's one I missed. I'm going to have to look that one up. Another reason to uh, revisit those old cards that I have to see if there's any of those crafts there. And... Yeah, lovely. Ah, yeah, that's true. Well said about the nostalgia piece. Very true, good advice. That bathroom tile piece you have came from past memories, not always good. It's true. So let's take what didn't work. We can learn to let that go, acknowledge it, let it go, 
make meaning of it in a way that helps us move forward, but we can also, yeah, pull the threads of those positive things as well. We don't have to let go of those. They can help make where we're at right now stronger and better and more enjoyable. And of course we can transform it and find a way to bring it into our future. So just lovely. Thanks so much for spending time with me, everybody. I'll see you again soon until we can connect and create with one another and get in person. I look forward to creating and connecting with you right here online. Thanks for being out there. Stay safe and take care of yourself and keep creating, folks. Bye.